I think Gyoropugi was a remarkable and astonishing personality who lived between the years of 1906 and 1967. He faced at first hand all the major political changes China was going through from the start of the 20th century all the way to the Cold War era. Puyi was born on the 7th of February 1906 at the Prince Tsun Mansion in Beijing to his parents Yulan Guwalgiya and Zai Feng or formerly known Prince Tsun. Only at the age of two he was chosen by the previous Empress Dowager Cixi on her deathbed to be the next emperor of the Qin dynasty. On the evening of 13 November 1908, Qin officials forcefully took little Puyi away from his parents in order for him to adopt a new life as the emperor. Neither of his parents were allowed to accompany him in the next following years of reign apart from his wet nurse Wen Chao Wong, who chaperoned and treated him like her own child. On December the 2nd, Bu Yi was formally enthroned as the Xuantong Emperor, even though he disliked the ceremony and constantly struggled and cried as he was named the Son of Heaven. The next four years were spent inside the Forbidden City, and although his father had become Prince Regent and was taking all the difficult decisions that the head of the state had to do, Little Puyi was nothing more than a tiny tyrant demanding his host of Evnooks to fulfill every single of his childish wishes. The Evnooks were men not only in China but in other Asian civilizations as well who had been castrated in order to serve and be loyal to the military, an aristocracy or a family. Only his stepmother, wet nurse Wen Cao Wang, was the one to put barriers and control a little boy's unmanageable desires. On October the 10th, 1911, the Wu Chang uprising took place, sparking a revolution across China known as the Xinhai Revolution, and its goal was to overthrow the foreign Manchu feudal reign and declare the Republic of China, establishing thus a democracy with Sun Yat-sen and the Kuomintang in control. Unfortunately for the young emperor and the few loyal autocratic followers that have been left, the support of the Qin dynasty amongst the people of China and more importantly amongst the army soldiers was fading away. Simultaneously, the ambitious general Yuan Sikai, who controlled the Qin army, forced Pu Yi's father Zhei Fang to abdicate as regent and negotiated with the revolutionaries. The revolutionaries at one hand wanted to have Sun Yat-sen as the first provisional president of the Republic of China, but on the other hand Yuan Sikai wanted to be himself the first president, so they reached to the agreement that if Yuan forced Pu Yi to abdicate, he can be so. On February the 12th, 1912, Yuan forced indeed Pu Yi to abdicate, thus ending the 267-year-old Manchu Qin rule and the 2,000-year-old imperial system establishing a republic. Three years later, on August 1915, Yuan abused his powers and dissolved the parliament, declaring a new Chinese empire and proclaiming himself as the emperor. The Kuomintang and Sun Yat-sen answered to that proclamation with a second democratic revolution. Not a whole year later, on the 6th of June 1916, Yuan died of uremia, consequently starting the era of warlords in China, where many provisional governments, ethnic and ideological revolutions and outside forces were fighting to grab their lion's share. In the meanwhile, Puyi remained locked up in the Forbidden City, not even being aware of the Xinhai Revolution, continuing his rule over the Evnooks and being exposed to Western technology introduced to him by Britain's share Reginald Johnston. Pu Yi was highly interested in the English language and other Western technological achievements such as bicycles, cameras, Western clothing and even glasses for his eyes. In 1917, a warlord named Zhang Tsun restored Pu Yi to the throne for the brief period of only 11 days before another rival warlord named Duan Tse Lui withheld the restoration. In 1919, when the Paris Peace Conference took place and all the German concessions and colonies in China were handed over to Japan and thousands of Chinese students protested against that, 
who he came in optical contact with those protests and saw for the first time the masses he was ruling previously. In 1922, Puyi at the age of 16 married two wives, Wan Rong and Wenxiu. Two years later, yet another warlord called Fen Yuxian expelled the 18-year-old former emperor from the Forbidden City. Pu Yi took residence in the Japanese embassy in Beijing for one and a half years and in 1925 he moved to the Japanese concession of Tianjin. Both he and the Japanese had a common enemy, the Han Chinese. In 1931, Pu Yi sent a delegation to the Japanese Prime Minister of War requesting to help him regain his throne. And with that excuse, the Japanese occupied Manchuria, the homeland of Pu Yi's ancestors. In November of 1931, Japan established the puppet country of Manchukuo and installed Pu Yi as the puppet emperor. He was constantly at odds with the Japanese in private, though gossingly submissive in public. During Pu Yi's reign in Manchukuo, he was constantly watched by the Japanese because not only they were questioning his loyalty to them, but also they wanted to Japanize Manchuria, just like what they were trying to do with Korea and Taiwan. An example of this Japanization is when the Japanese forced Puyi to make Sintoism the country's former religion, in contrast of his personal Buddhist beliefs. In 1937, Puyi married his third wife, a Manchu 16-year-old called Tan Yuling, who died five years later. It is widely heard that she was poisoned by the Japanese for being more controlling to Puyi than them. At the same year, just before the Second Sino-Japanese War, the Japanese concentrated the most of their influence in Manchuria by removing Puyi's original staff and replacing them with Japanese sympathizers. In 1943, Puyi married his fourth wife, a 14-year-old Han Chinese called Li Yuqin. For much of the Second Sino-Japanese War and World War II, Puyi confined to the salt tax palace in Changchun, believing that Japan was on the winning side. On August 1945, when the Soviet Union declared war on Japan, the bombings of the Red Air Force and the advances of the Red Army forced Puyi to hide in his basement. After two failed attempts to flee to Japan, the Red Army captured and imprisoned Puyi. During his time in the prisons of Chita and later Khabarovsk, he was treated very well. The Soviets let him hold his servants and they were even protecting him by the nationalist Chinese and Chiang Kai-shek who wanted his execution due to high treason. Pu Yi testified at the Tokyo war crimes trial in 1946 and he was found not guilty. There he spoke with great detail of how he was treated by the Japanese as an unwilling tool of propaganda. In 1950, in contrast of his request to Stalin not to be sent back to China, he was repatriated in order to warm up the relations between the Soviet Union and Communist China. In China, Pu Yi spent 10 of his years in a re-education camp, where he adopted the Chinese communist way of life and thinking. He was daily interacting with normal and ordinary people and had to learn all the vital things that his servants were doing for him. In 1959, Pu Yi came out of the camp and lived in an ordinary Beijing residence with his sister, before being transferred to a government-sponsored hotel. In those years, Pu Yi worked at the Beijing Botanical Gardens and married his fifth and last wife, Li Shuxian, in 1962. He subsequently worked as an editor for the Literacy Department of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference before becoming a member of it, an office he held from 1964 until his death in 1967. He died in Beijing due to his declined health at the age of 61. And that's the story of the last emperor of China. Thank you for watching.